Hello, and welcome to the View from Mayor Brown podcast. This is a fortnightly podcast series for employment lawyers and HR practitioners, which highlights developments in case law and legislative changes of importance to UK employers. It is presented by Nicholas Robertson, the head of Mayor Brown's London employment team. The time spent listening to these podcasts can count towards your training requirements. At the end of the podcast, we will explain how to get in touch if you have any comments or questions. Hello and welcome to podcast number 113. Apologies if I'm sounding a bit blocked up today. Uh, if anyone has any good cures for hay fever, please do write in and let me know. Um, the pollen season has started with a vengeance. Anyway, in time-honoured fashion, we've got three cases. The first is a useful case with a clear warning to employers about employee liability information, which obviously arises in the context of the transfer of undertakings regulations. The second is a follow-up on the EU headscarf case, and no, I still cannot say the name of the claimants, but uh, I felt it's such an important case we need to deal with it. Finally, we have a tribunal case dealing with one of the more obscure areas of employment law, which are the provisions preventing employers offering inducements to employees to give up on collective bargaining via a recognised trade union. It's not an area that comes up very often, but I thought it was a useful case just to flag to people, since it's got a pretty nasty sting in the tail if you get it wrong, as I shall explain. As usual, you can access the podcast via iTunes, on the Mayor Brown website, or YouTube, and the Twitter feed, it's Nicholas Robertson, Nicholas R-O-B-E-R-1-1, which is also where we post out our links to the cases uh, that we've discussed on the podcast. So, first up, uh, Born Born London Limited and Spire. One of the more recent bits of tinkering with the transfer regulations saw the introduction of the concept of employee liability information. This is an obligation under Regulation 11 of TUPI for the transferor to provide the transferee with employee information about transferring staff. Employee liability information is information about the identity and age of the employees who are going to be transferring, the particulars of employment that the employer is obliged to give under Section 1 of the Employment Rights Act 1996, Section 1 Statement in effect, also information about discipline and grievance procedures brought against transferring employees, and information about any court or tribunal claim brought by a transferring employee against the transferor in the previous two years, or which the transferor has reasonable grounds to believe may be brought against the transferee, along with information about any collective agreement which may have effect after the transfer. Information is to be provided not less than 28 days before the relevant transfer, and the information must be no more than 14 days out of date at that point. If there is a claim that the transferor has failed to provide employee liability information, then that goes to the Employment Tribunal. If the claim is upheld, the Employment Tribunal may make a declaration and may make an award of compensation of such sum as it considers just and equitable, taking account of the loss caused to the transferee by the failure to provide the right information, and taking account as well of the terms of any contract between the transferor and transferee regulating the transfer. Presuming this is to avoid any double recovery if the same breach is also a breach of warranty in the transfer documentation. So what information are we talking about in this case? Well, this case related to a printing of catalogues for Sotheby's. It was outsourced initially to Spire, which is a print finishing firm. When that contract ended, Sotheby's then passed the work to Bourne. 32 employees transferred from Spire to Bourne on 1 January 2015. There was no dispute that this was covered by Chupi. Ahead of the transfer, Spire provided Bourne with employee liability information. Spire divided the information it was providing into contractual and non-contractual information. One of the things they said was that there was a non-contractual Christmas bonus for each employee, which came to one week's pay plus £7.50 per year of service and this bonus was payable at the end of November each year. After the transfer, various of the transferring employees provided to Bourne copies of particulars of their employment, which made no reference to the bonus being non-contractual. Others had particulars of employment that said the bonus was contractual. The evidence was also that all 32 employees had in fact been paid bonus for every year that they were employed by Spire. Bourne took the view that the bonus was contractual, and that the information from Spire was therefore wrong. They sought compensation of about £100,000, saying that the cost of the alleged non-contractual bonus, which was in fact contractual for the employees over the lifetime of the contract, would come to this sort of sum. In a second tribunal claim, Bourne also applied for a statement under the Employment Rights Act 1996, Section 1, for a declaration that the bonus was in fact contractual. And that second claim, the Section 1 statement claim, was upheld. 
But back with the Regulation 11 claim, the Employee Liability Claim, the Employment Tribunal struck this claim out on the grounds it had no reasonable prospects of success. Bourne appealed to the EAT, so the reported decision we now have is the EAT decision as to whether or not it was arguable that there was a claim for misdescription of the Christmas bonus. If the bonus was contractual and the existence of the bonus was disclosed in the employee liability information document, but it was wrongly described as non-contractual, was that a breach of the obligation to provide employee liability information? You might think that was obvious. If the employee liability information wrongly describes the character of the bonus, surely that's a breach. Not so fast. Well, the starting point is to look at the basis for disclosure of the information. Employee liability information in relation to transferring um, pay and bonuses is uh, disclosable under the category of particulars of employment that an employer is obliged to give an employee pursuant to Section 1 of the Employment Rights Act 1996, i.e. Section 1 Statement. So, the next stage is to establish whether the bonus was contractual as a matter of law, and the outcome of that was, yes it was, because that was the second tribunal claim that Bourne bought and won. So far, so good for Bourne. So, you have a clear statement that the bonus is not contractual and a court determination that it is contractual. However, this tribunal, considering the Regulation 11 complaint and the employee liability information, then looked in detail as to whether or not an employer providing a Section 1 statement to an employee had to provide a statement as to whether or not it was a contractual bonus. And they came to the view that it was not the function of the Section 1 statement to state whether something was contractual or not. Court pointed out that if Section 1 was solely focused on contractual payments, then employees might not be told about discretionary pay items in a Section 1 statement, and so they would be denied... The, the obligation to have written information about pay and benefits. Once it was accepted, the tribunal said, that a Section 1 statement could cover both contractual and, or non-contractual matters, it follows that employee liability information too could cover contractual and non-contractual matters. Therefore, the tribunal said, and the EAT accepted, it was not necessary for the employee liability information to state whether a bonus was contractual or not. It followed from that that if Spire misdescribed the bonus as being non-contractual, this gave rise to no claim under Regulation 11. If it had failed to disclose the existence of the bonus, contractual or otherwise, then that would have given rise to a claim. Disclosing it um, in accordance with the legislation, but adding voluntarily they thought it was non-contractual, did not give rise to a claim. Well, obviously, you'd hope that in most cases, employers would know whether a bonus is contractual or not. But that's easier said than done. And um, we've certainly come across plenty of cases where it's been very unclear. Often, the bonus may start off fully discretionary, but over a period of years, it becomes codified in effect. And if it's always paid out, irrespective of the exercise of any discretion. The real learning point for this case is that employee liability information may have, be of little assistance to a disappointed transferee who relies on the information provided through the statutory route and then finds out there are inaccuracies. It's far better for the transferee, of course, to have appropriate clauses regulating disclosure, warranties, for example. Here, depending on the contractual terms that are agreed between Bourne and Spire, it may be that Bourne would have had a claim based on misrepresentation, for uh, example, or for breach of warranty. The case reveals that relying simply on information disclosed as employee liability information may be less than satisfactory. So, that's the case of Bourne, London Limited and Spire. Next up, Dunkley and others and Corstal UK Limited. Corstal being spelt K-O-R-S-T-A-L. This is a case in the Employment Tribunal which highlights a relatively unknown aspect of employment law, so I wanted to flag it up. I suspect there are cases where employers get away without any sanction because they're not challenged on what they've done, and people generally don't know about this area. Equally, the consequences of getting things wrong are pretty costly, so I wanted to make people generally aware of this area. Before I deal with the facts, it's probably easiest just to explain the legal situation, and then the facts will make sense. Under Section 145B of the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act 1992, there is a prohibition on an employer buying out collective bargaining rights. So the employer cannot make an offer to members of a tra recognised trade union to give up being represented at a collective level by the trade union in return for an inducement. This came out of a European case some years back now called Wilson. It used to be relatively standard practice, certainly when I started off, if the employer wanted to de-recognise the union, in effect, for collective bargaining purposes, it would offer revised contracts of employment to employees in return for them giving up collective bargaining with the union. The European Court ruled this was unlawful, and so Section 145B was enacted. 
the legis- under the legislation, the employer is prohibited from offering uh, members of a recognised trade union uh, an incentive if the sole or main purpose is to achieve what is called a prohibited result. And the prohibited result is a result that the workers' terms of employment, or any of the individual terms, will not be determined by collective agreement with the union. If there is a breach, the tribunal can award compensation, but, and here's a sting in the tail, there's a minimum award, and that minimum award is £3,830 per employee covered by the award. So that applies even if there is no loss, because if you think about it, it'd be very difficult for the employee to show there's been any loss, particularly if they've accepted an inducement from the employer not to be represented by the recognised union. So, as I say, it's £3,830, and that's just a minimum award. Tribunal can award more. The burden of proof is against the employer. It's up to the employer to show why it made the offer, and obviously the tribunal will look at the events leading up to the point at which the employer makes the offer. If there's been a bust-up with the union during pay negotiations and the employer is trying to get around the union, then that's obviously going to be quite a difficult situation, shall we say. Conversely, for example, in the statute, it indicates that if the employer has has made offers to reward some, but not all of the employees affected, for, let's say, a high level of performance, or to stop them leaving, or because they're of special value to the business, then that may indicate the intention has nothing to do with getting the union out of the picture, either on this particular pay round, or more generally. So, let's apply that to the situation here. Corstal has recently recognised a trade union, which is Unite. Obviously, with the recognised trade union comes formal pay negotiations, and the intention was that this would take place on an annual basis. Pay negotiations started in October 2015, not that long after Unite had won compulsory recognition through the statutory ballot. There was a series of negotiations, and the employer proposed a basic pay rise and a Christmas bonus. In return, the employer proposed that there were going to be some rationalisation of benefits around things like sick pay. The pay proposals were put by Unite to the employees in a ballot and they were heavily rejected. The employer then followed this up by making individual offers to its employees, reiterating the offers which had been rejected at the ballot. The company then had sent out two communications. The first communication said they wanted the employees to have the opportunity of having a Christmas bonus. Um, and said that if the employees didn't accept the offer before Christmas, then the Christmas bonus would be off the table if the offer was accepted after Christmas. Then the company wrote again to employees saying that obviously the changes would not be made to individuals' contracts unless they agreed. But if no agreement was reached with an individual, the company reserved the right to dismiss employees who were, in my terms, refuseniks. It also pointed out that a significant number of employees had now accepted the offer, which should be made to them individually, and, the employer said, this included trade union members and their representatives. About a year later, a collective agreement covering that particular pay round was agreed with the union. However, a number of employees, 57 in all, bought a claim that the employer had broken section 145B by what it had done. So how do you think the tribunal approached this? Well, obviously the employer had written directly to the employees on two occasions, a letter in December 2015 and a letter in January 2016. What light did these letters shed on the company's motivation of its offer to the staff? The company argued that it was merely seeking a way through what was otherwise a stalemate situation. It tried to argue that it was not trying to stop the employees having collective bargaining agreements and collective bargaining rights. It was merely trying to seek a way through the stalemate. However, the tribunal, and I think correctly, wasn't into this. They pointed out that what the company was doing here was to try and get around collective bargaining agreements, so on this occasion the employees would be given incentive to give up their collective bargaining rights. The company was looking to get individuals to agree what it could not get them to agree collectively. Secondly, the tribunal also said it was irrelevant that there was subsequently a collective bargaining agreement reached with the union, which covered these terms. In effect, the ground had been taken out from underneath the union, so they had very little choice with the collective agreement that was then entered into in 2016. As the tribunal put it, the employer could not drop in and out of collective bargaining to suit its purposes. So, the tribunal went on to consider why the employer had made the offer and whether it was, in fact, for a prohibited purpose. It pointed out, of course, that given what had happened, the burden was on the employer to prove it hadn't made the offer for a prohibited purpose. The argument that the letters were about enabling the employees to have access to the Christmas bonus were rejected by the tribunal. First of all, this was a threat the employer was making to withdraw the Christmas bonus, so the employer was offering the employees an opportunity to sidestep a threat it had made. Doesn't sound terribly attractive when it's put like that, does it? The other thing is that it would not the, it would not explain why the letter that was sent out in January 2016 to the staff, but by which time the Christmas bonus was lo- no longer on the table for those who had not accepted the offer before Christmas. 
The tribunal find it quite interesting. The employer had drawn the attention of the workforce to the fact that trade union representatives and trade union members had accepted the offer. This did indicate that there was a degree of animosity towards the trade union on the part of the company. So the company made a decision to bypass the collective bargaining process and go back to individual negotiations, in the view of the tribunal, and both letters were a breach of section 145. The tribunal has not, as I understand it, gone on toward compensation. However, there must be a risk, the tribunal is saying, that each letter is a reach of section 145, and that would mean that each of the employees is entitled to two minimum awards. On the basis that there are 57 claimants, that would produce an award of somewhere over £430,000 to the employees, even if the tribunal only awards the minimum payment. And remember, that's only the minimum payment. Obviously, this could put a significant dent in the sort of sums that the company was trying to save by... Um, by which we were trying to save during the collective bargaining um, round and rejecting whatever the union was asking for in that pay round. Obviously, this is a difficult area. There have been relatively few cases, and I don't think any case has ever gone to the AT. There's also one tribunal decision where the employer was able to escape a claim under Section 145B on the grounds that it was trying to break an impasse that had arisen. I think the best advice that can be given is if you're in an area where collective bargaining is broken down and, and you're looking at writing directly to employees, you need to be very careful as to whether it would be something that could trigger a claim under this. Because certainly when cases like this get publicity, um, the claimant lawyers and claimants themselves are going to be all over it. Thirdly and finally, um, ACBITA and G4S Secure Solutions and Bunyai and Micropol SA. These are the two cases about the outcome of the Islamic headscarf uh, cases in the European uh, Court. I mentioned these, I think I ranted about them, it's probably fair to say, at the stage of the two Advocate General's opinion. If you remember, one of the Advocate General's opinions found that there was no discrimination, another found that there was discrimination. We now have the ECJ decision in both cases. So, where have they got to? Well, there's some good news and there's some not so good news, I think. In the Akbita case, the employer was arguing that it had a practice of religious neutrality. All religious symbols, and political and philosophical symbols, were banned. And this is contained in a written instruction to staff. The company asserted it wished to be completely neutral in relation to its customers and suppliers. The ECJ took the view that there was no evidence that this had been applied differently to the claimant from other staff. If the rule was applied neutrally, then this, this ban was not direct discrimination. It was potentially indirect discrimination, because although all employees were treated equally, the impact would be different, given that such a ban would disproportionately affect, say, followers of, a, of particular religions. So, in that case, it would be necessary to look at objective justification. In general terms, the ECJ said that if an employer wanted to project a neutral image towards public and private sector clients, this could be a legitimate aim for the business. It would be necessary to consider whether the, this aim was genuinely pursued and whether it was applied fairly and consistently. They did, the court did indicate that it may be necessary to consider whether the policy applied to all employees or whether it was only those who had interaction with external third parties. If the policy applied only to those who had external facing roles, then that could potentially be a justified policy in the context of seeking to maintain a completely neutral image. It did, however, flag up the prospect that an employer should consider whether moving an individual who was externally facing, but who was suffering as a result of this policy, to a non external facing role. In the Bunyai case, the court acknowledged it was not clear whether there was such a neutrality policy being applied, or whether instead the employer was simply relying on adverse comments from a customer, which had led to the employee's dismissal. Interestingly, the court accepted that the dismissal of the individual was based on the customer's unwillingness to be served by someone wearing an Islamic headscarf. This would amount to direct discrimination. The concerns of a particular customer would not be justification for directly discriminatory actions. All told, these cases do leave me slightly puzzled. I have to wonder whether an English employment tribunal would take the same precise approach to the facts. Clearly the legal determination is binding, but I think factually a, a, a tribunal in the UK might take a rather different approach. And I think my concern is more around the application of the alleged policy of neutrality. Court said the policy needs to be applied consistently, and it's, looking at, and it's important it was looking as well at curtailing the symbols of philosophical, religious and political beliefs as a sort of job lot when it came to neutrality. This seems to be wholly unrealistic or disproportionate as a policy. It also leads you into some quite odd places. A man who wears a turban to work because he wants to and disavows any religious or ethnic significance to the turban is, prepared, is, is permitted to wear it, but a man who is a Sikh can't. <coughs> a woman who is not a Muslim 
can wear a headscarf to work, but a woman who is a Muslim can't. Equally, what about unobtrusive items indicating adherence to a particular faith, or items that will only be recognised if you yourself are a member of that faith? All in all, I think it's very hard to understand the practical rationale here, and short of asking people to wear uniforms to work, it seems terribly easy to have a policy that goes too far, or is not genuinely neutral. That said, if I was looking for a glass-half-full view on this, I'd say that the comments about individual customer preference um, not justifying dismissal are both correct and helpful. One thing's for certain. I don't think we've heard the last of this, and there will no doubt be other cases on dress codes to come. And, as I say, I think I'd expect a, a UK employment tribunal to take a closer look at the justification of such a policy and its proportionality uh, in today's society. So that's the case of ACBETA and G4S Secure Solutions and Bunyai and Micropole. Well, that brings a close to episode 113. Thank you very much for listening. Confirm, as always, that no employees were harmed or mistreated in any way in the making of this podcast. And as I say, send me your hay fever remedies and uh, hopefully I'll sound a little less blocked up in the next podcast. Thanks very much indeed. Stay safe. So that was our latest podcast. We hope you found it useful. If you have any questions or comments please email Nick on nrobertson at mayorbrown.com. Our podcasts are an overview of cases. How the law applies in any particular case will obviously depend on the individual circumstances. So please take legal advice if any of the matters discussed are relevant to issues that you are dealing with. And thank you for listening.